it is definitely an honor. I'm loud, so we're going to have to get that further away from me. Well, it's definitely an honor to be with you tonight. I do appreciate Jeff and the elders inviting me here. And when I heard that you were studying on the topic of the Holy Spirit, I was very excited because I think it is a topic uh, that we don't study often enough. Uh, That being said, I was also scared uh, that Jeff is letting a bunch of guys come in and teach topics on the Holy Spirit uh, because uh, there is a lot of ink that has been spilled on this topic. But the good news is, I don't have to talk about all that. I only have to try and keep it focused on the little section uh, that Jeff has given me in Ephesians 1. And that's probably not going to happen, because we do have to cover quite a bit. Um, So if you will be turning over to your Bibles to Ephesians 1, and I do want to have some dialogue. And we're going to go in a very... We're going to talk about the end first, and then kind of work our way through. So Ephesians chapter 1... And before we get into our lesson text tonight, I have a question for you. And that question is this. What is heaven going to be like? What do you think, based on what you've read of scripture? What are you hoping for in heaven? What are you looking forward to? Better than your best day on earth. I've had some pretty good days on earth. So better than your best day on earth. I like it. What else are you looking forward to? Yes, sir. Reunited with past loved ones. Absolutely. What else are you looking forward to in heaven? Just being, well, why do you say that? Because that's our home. I like it. What else are you looking forward to about heaven or are you expecting out of heaven? No pain, no sorrow, right? I was talking to, when I got here, Jeff and I met uh, in the bathroom uh, because uh, as I get older, I find uh, car rides, I can't go as long in a car ride, right? Uh, I spent my last birthday on a heating pad. You know, as you get older, things start to ache and creak, so definitely no more pain, no more sorrow. Anyone else have something they're looking forward to? Being with the Lord. Absolutely, that's, that's, that was the one I was thinking about too. And, and none of the answers have been wrong at all. But I think, about, I think about Moses, right, who went into the tent of meeting. And he goes into the tent of meeting and he gets just a glimpse of the glory of God. And he comes out of that tent and he is so radiant, so bright from having come into the presence of God that all the Israelites say, Moses, Moses, put a cover on it. Just tone it down a little bit. And he's getting a glimpse. And when you and I get to heaven, we get to see the full glory of God. Because you see, in order to appreciate our topic for tonight, the Holy Spirit as a deposit, you've got to appreciate what is it a deposit for. So let us go to Ephesians chapter 1, verses, uh, we're going to pick up in verse 11 and go down to verse 14. I'm going to be reading from the English Standard Version, so there might be a couple of word choices a little bit different. It says, in him we have obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to the purpose of of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will, so that we who were the first to hope in Christ might be to the praise of his glory. In him you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in him, were sealed with the promise of the Holy Spirit, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it to the praise of his glory. Now our time we are going to be spent primarily taking thoughts from verse 14. But I believe last week you talked about being sealed by the Spirit. So we won't necessarily have to rehash all of that. But suffice to say, being sealed is a sign of ownership, it's a sign of authority, uh, it is something meaning set up, this is that, right? It's not random, it's not 
unintentional, you are sealed. All right? So, specifically, verse 14, we see that the Holy Spirit is the guarantee or the deposit of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it to the praise of His glory. So, what we are waiting for, what you and I are wanting, yearning for, longing for, is something we don't have yet. Right? And I, I don't know about you, we're getting on into the Christmas season, and families have a lot of different traditions when it comes to uh, this time of year. Now, for me as a kid, Christmas morning was it, right? Right, it's just like a Christmas story. You, you can't wait to get all the presents, and did I get the Red Ryder BB gun, or did I get a, a bunny suit? You know, you're looking forward to it. Now, in my family, though, on Christmas Eve, you got to get a gift. So you didn't. You got a little taste of what the next day was going to be like, and I see from some of the nods that your families were as, as well. Well, that's what Paul is writing about here, that the Holy Spirit serves as a deposit for our future, a deposit, a, a down payment on something that will eventually be ours, right? In 1 Peter chapter 1, The Apostle Peter writes about it, and he says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, unfading, kept in heaven for you, who by God's power are being guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. In this you rejoice, though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials, so that the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold that perishes though it is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. So what Peter gives is this image of heaven waiting for you. And it's not something that's gonna, gonna spoil, it's not something that's gonna, gonna be out of fashion, it is not something that you're not gonna want. It is, in a word, perfection. Perfection is waiting for you. And if you stop and think about it, this world is all about imperfection, isn't it? Right? The reason that you have those aches and pains is imperfection. Right? The reason why we have only ever heard of a glimpse of the glory of God is because of imperfection. Right? I heard in a sermon this last Sunday talking about just how wonderful it must have been in the Garden of Eden to walk with God in the cool of the day. A wonderful thing. And so... Paul, writing to the Ephesians, writes to them to remind them that you've got something better waiting. Okay? Now, something you need to keep in mind about the church at Ephesus. The church at Ephesus was an imperfect church. It was not a church that had everything figured out, right? When we go back and we look at what we know about the church at Ephesus... We see that Paul comes to Ephesus and he spends a period of time there. And then when Paul leaves, he doesn't leave under the best of circumstances. He has to leave because of a riot. And then he goes off a little ways and we have that beautiful image of Paul and the Ephesian elders at Miletus. And this is mid-50s A.D., and he says to them, be careful, because after I leave, fierce wolves are going to come in and cause you to swerve from the truth. Okay? That's mid-50s. Ephesians is written early 60s. 
And what we see from Ephesians is Paul opening up by reminding them, you've got something better than this life. He goes on to talk about the need to be unified. He goes on to talk about to walk in love and to flee from sexual immorality. He goes on to talk about the whole armor of God. Something has happened from the time he left to the time he writes this letter that they needed to hear these words. And then a couple years later, mid-60s A.D., he writes a letter to a young man. He says, Timothy, Timothy, my son in the faith. And if you know what's in 1 Timothy, it's to put elders and deacons in place. So somewhere between 55-ish and 65-ish, they lost their eldership. We don't know why. We don't know how. We don't know what. But it's clear that the church at Ephesus was not a perfect church. And it's within that context that Paul writes to them and says to them that the Holy Spirit is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it to the praise of his glory. Now, when you think about an inheritance, what comes to your mind? Is it a Bible story or a personal experience? A birthright? Scott, what do you think about? Something you haven't earned? Fair enough. That's right. Absolutely. 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 You know, someone passes away and there's something to split. That's when you find out who people really are. You know, say that again. Ooh, there has to be a death in order for you to have an inheritance. I like that. That is very true. Anything else? Do we consider inheritances second best? What do you think? I don't, but that's my opinion. So, but inheritances become second best when they're splitting, right? That's when things, well, but I love granny silverware or whatever. That's when the argument happens. But what if an inheritance wasn't split what if you got a hundred percent of the best of the best wouldn't that be something you know it's hard I, I don't envy my my grandmother passed away uh, well, my mother's mother passed away last year and I, I don't envy her having to buy Christmas gifts for the grandkids because there was six or seven of us and she had to get us all gifts, and she didn't want to make it like one grandchild was more important than the other, right? I remember one year, one of the grand, like one set of grandchildren got like TVs, and they were huge because this was a long time ago. And one of the children and got grandchildren got something else, and they they pitched such a fit. But I didn't get a TV. What's a grandparent to do? So a few days later, they got a TV, you know, because you don't you, you as a grandparent you don't want to one necessarily play favorites, not in that way anyway. Well, let's, let's turn over to Romans chapter 8. Okay, Romans chapter 8. We're going to pick up in verse 12. Okay? So then, brothers, we are debtors not to the flesh to live according to the flesh. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of your body, you will live. For all who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. For you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received the Spirit of 
of adoption as sons by whom we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. If children, then heirs, heirs of God, and fellow heirs with Christ, provided we suffer with him in order that we may be glorified with him. And so you see how the thought previously in Ephesians 1 ties into the thought of verse 14, the idea that you were sealed by the Spirit. The fact that we're sealed by the Spirit means that we have been adopted. It is that sign of adoption. Right? You go back and you think about any important document, and you have to have that document notarized, right? The seal of the Holy Spirit is that stamp of approval, this is my child, and everything that comes with it to the fullest. And so that's one thing the Holy Spirit's doing, is it's saying this is a son or daughter of God, and then the Holy Spirit's also going, here is a glimpse. All right? So, that's the easy bit. Okay? What are we getting? Why are we able to get this inheritance? Now, the inheritance is heaven. The hard part is what does that deposit look like? That's the hard part. And that's where we're going to spend the remainder of our time this evening. What does the deposit of the Holy Spirit look like? Well, it's safe to say that it is not miraculous spiritual gifts. So it's not the speaking in tongues, it's not prophetic powers, it's not miraculous healing. You say, Matt, how do you know that? Well, because this deposit is given to all Christians. So every Christian who has ever lived has been given this down payment on their future glory. Okay? Now, I'm going to throw this out there. We're going to just have a little discussion, see how it goes. Uh, And then if we get too far off the rails, we'll just jump back, back on. What does the deposit or guarantee of the Holy Spirit look like? How does it manifest in the Christian? Because I think that's really the thing we want to know, isn't it? And you might say, well, we don't know. That's always an answer. What do you think? I'm just fishing right now. I'll let you know if I catch anything. So, well, if you get the answer right out the gate, where's the fun in fishing? That's why it's called fishing, not catching. All right, so we've got one thought on the fruits of the Spirit. Are there any other thoughts? Scott? Okay. Mm. Okay, so we've got obedience. All right, so your the deposit is you doing what God said. Okay. Yes, sir? Yeah? Mm Mm-hmm. I like that. I like that metaphor. I like that imagery. Um, Because if you stop and think about it, 
it's a down payment on a, ho- on a house we can't afford, right? And so it's, it's not like an FHA loan where you put 3% you know, percent down. It is a huge mansion, you know, in, in the good neighborhood, and we're going to get to live there, right? And so, but it would seem that what the deposit is suggesting or the guarantee is suggesting is that you and I get to go live in the pool house until we get to go live in the big house. Because the idea of the deposit, the word that is used here, is first money given. Okay, That's what it is. It's first given. And it is the idea of something that has been given with the goal of receiving the rest. And so like a house is a very excellent example. So any other thoughts on what does that guarantee look like? Mm. Okay. Absolutely. Yes, sir. Any others? Scott? So it's presence and protection. Okay. Yes, sir. It does, but I would also suggest to you that the fundamental and primary purpose that the, in Scripture anyway, that the Holy Spirit serves is the get-it-done component of God, right? And so God, it, and I hate, I hate putting the, the language there, but you gotta, we, I got to put it some way to get it through my head. God comes up with the idea, Christ oversees the idea, the Spirit gets it done, right? And so we read, especially throughout the Old Testament, right, the Spirit of God. And we see those things. And we even see in the New Testament glimpses looking back to where the Spirit was active and maybe they didn't exactly understand it, right? But we often read the phrase, the Spirit of God came upon, or the Spirit of God departed. Same Spirit. And that's where it gets a little dangerous. I don't want to backtrack too much, but... We we can't we gotta be careful we don't make the Holy Spirit into a one trick pony. Very busy the Holy Spirit is, does a lot. Um, so, but yes, to talk about that he manifests is to to know God it is in a way. Let me suggest to you that we're all right, that everything you've said is correct, and let's tie it all together. Let's go over to Galatians and see how it ties together. Now, I would also suggest to you, and we are going to go to the fruits of the Spirit. I had no doubt we would get there very quickly, but I also don't want us to just give a reflex answer, the fruits of the Spirit, right? I work a lot with young people, and um, you ask questions to young people, and you've got to be careful, because God, Jesus, the Bible, right? 
we got to be careful that we don't train ourselves to give reflexive answers and never give thoughtful answers. And I'm no way suggesting that you didn't give a thoughtful answer, brother, because I think you did. So, because, but I also want us to think that there may be more to this fruits of the Spirit than maybe sometimes we, I, let me phrase it this way, there are more to the fruits of the Spirit than I sometimes give them credit for. I will just talk to me, Matt, on that one. But we go over to the book of Galatians, chapter 5. And in verse 16, he says, walk, but I say walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the desires of the flesh are against the Spirit. And the desires of the Spirit are against the flesh, for, though, for these are opposed to each other to keep you from doing the things that you want to do. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. Nor the works of the flesh are evident. Now the works of the flesh are evident. Sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of rage, um, rivalries, dissension, divisions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and things like these. I warn you as I warned you before that those who do, not, or who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. And those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified with the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live, if we live by the Spirit, let us also keep in step with the Spirit. And so here in the book of Galatians, Paul paints this image of the Spirit manifesting itself in the life of the Christian with these attributes of love, love, love joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Now, as we talk about the guarantee of the Holy Spirit, we know that the Spirit is with Christians. I believe if you go back and look at the promise in Acts chapter 2 where Peter is preaching the first gospel sermon and he talks about the gift of the Holy Spirit, that that is going to be for you and for all those who are far off. I believe that the gift in Acts chapter 2 and the seal and the guarantee, it's all part of the package that goes to each and every Christian and has since the establishment of Christianity. And you stop and you think, Scott said that, you know, well, the, the guarantee, the deposit, is righteousness. Well, what is righteousness? Righteousness is right living. So then, if I manifest in my life, obeying the will of God, doing what he has said to do, then something's going to happen. These fruits of the Spirit are going to manifest, right? And just like if you're a gardener, you put amendments to the soil, right? There needs to be a specific cocktail of different things that you add, ammonium, nitrogen, all to the soil in order to what? Get the best growth possible. Well, look, do we have a corner on the market of joy? Are there people who have joyous moments who aren't Christians? I think they are, right? Are there gentle people that aren't Christians? I think there are. But their motivation, their guarantee is not in the same thing. And so as joyous as someone can be outside of Christ, it pales in comparison to the joy that you can have in Christ. Why? Because we know that that joy is not as good as it gets. Like the brother said earlier, right? Heaven is better than our greatest day on earth. Well, if you think this is all that there is, then your greatest day on earth is the greatest it's ever going to be. That's kind of sad. But that's the way people who aren't in Christ, that's all they've got. Now, that's a, a blanket statement because 
We're not getting into comparative religions in the 10 minutes we've got left. But I would suggest to you this. That life in Christ is different than life outside of Christ. And if you grew up not in the church, you maybe know that a little bit more than someone who grew up in the church. Or if you had a rebellious face. If you've ever been separated from the love of God, you know how empty it feels. But I think about some of Paul's other statements about deposits and guarantees. In 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 21 and 22. It is God who establishes us with you in Christ and has anointed us, who has put his seal on us and given us his spirit in our hearts as a guarantee. So the spirit of God dwells in your heart. And that's where I'm going to leave that, and I'll let Jeff spend more time about the indwelling of the Spirit and how that works. You're welcome. But suffice to say, the Spirit is in Christians, and it is there to let you know what Peter said, you've got something waiting for you. You have got something better than this. And if you're doing the right thing, if you are obeying the will of God, you are practicing righteousness, then you know that the right living that you're doing is getting you that much closer to heaven. And the natural response is going to be joy. It's going to be peace and patience. In my, in my day job, I um, theoretically work in a Christian organization. And when I say that, what I mean is, when HR talks to people, they say, we're a Christian organization, do you have a problem with that? Nope, and you got a pulse? Come on in. And I wish it was more difficult than that, but it's not. But, but everybody who works in this organization does not act like a Christian. And so I find myself going, huh. Huh. What's going to make me different than these people? And you can ask that even if you don't work at a Christian organization. Because that question is what's important in our lives. What makes me different from all those around me? And the answer is what I'm looking forward to. Right? They say that there are three vacations that you go on. There is the vacation that you look forward to, the vacation that you go on, and the vacation that you remember. Right now, we are all looking forward to an eternal vacation, the most perfect vacation that there could ever be. I don't know about you, but whenever I've got PTO coming on, I'm just watching that clock. Right? Just like a kid in school. That bell can't ring soon enough. Right? A couple weeks before I start making sure that I booked the hotel, that I got, do I know what our general route's going to be to get there? Can't wait to get there. And so the Holy Spirit functions as a reminder that you've got that waiting for you. And perhaps the best example that I can give of it is an experience that we have all experienced, and that is the death of someone whom we dearly love. Unfortunately, over the last couple of years, we've had to experience a lot more of that than we would like. But I guarantee you, you have all been to funerals, and you've been to two kinds of funerals. You've been to the funeral of those who are Christians, and the funeral of those who are not Christians. And if you've never noticed this, notice it. There is a different attitude at the funeral of a Christian than there is a non-Christian. Both are grieving. Both are suffering from the loss of a loved one. And 
there is nothing that diminishes that love, that, that, that sadness and sorrow. But at the funeral of a Christian, there's that feeling of knowing that as sad as it is now, this isn't the end. And so in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, I have read this, and, and Jeff, you have probably read this, and I don't know how many funerals over the years. But the way it ends is using the exact same word that Paul wrote in Ephesians 1 and 14. For we know that if the tent that is our earthly home is destroyed, we have a building from God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. For in this tent we groan longing to put on our heavenly dwelling, if indeed by putting it on we may not be found naked. For while we are in this tent we groan being burdened, not that we would be unclothed, but that we would be further clothed. So that what is mortal may be swallowed up by life. He who has prepared us for this very thing is God, who has given us the Spirit as a guarantee. You see, everything that God is doing with the Spirit, has done, is doing, is preparing us to move into the big house. It is preparing us to have that home where there is no sorrow or pain, that home where there are no heartaches, where we see those who have gone on in Christ, that being in the presence of God. And those fruits of the Spirit, the love that we have as Christians, it's different from love outside of Christianity. That joy that we have as Christians is different than any joy that can be experienced outside of Christianity. All of those fruits come from walking that path of righteousness and serve as an encouragement and a reminder that we have got something better waiting. We are a saved people, but the blood is continually cleansing us from our sin if we stay the course so that one day we can receive that home in heaven. And then we get that full inheritance. We're not getting second best when we get to heaven. Are there any last thoughts, questions, or comments before we close in a prayer? Well, I thank you for your time and attentiveness. Again, I thank you very much for uh, the invitation to come and speak, and I pray that you've been able to take something away from our time of study together. Jeff?